there's about two weeks left to the regular season. And the playoff matchups are right now anyone's guess. You are locked on MLB. Your daily MLB podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Hello, baseball fans, and welcome to Locked On MLB, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, where it's your team every day. This is the daily podcast. We talk about all the Major League Baseball. I am your host, Paul Francis Sullivan, right there. You can call me Sully. I am an Emmy-nominated television producer who has been a baseball podcaster for well over a decade now, and this is wrapping up my fifth full season here at the Locked On Podcast Network. It's your team every day. Follow us at Locked On MLB Pods on Twitter or whatever it's called now. Also on Instagram, you can follow me. I'm your pal, Sully Man, Sully Baseball on Twitter, Sully Baseball Podcast on Instagram. And hey, swing for the fences on Sleeper Picks, and you can win up to 100 times your money. Download the Sleeper app and use promo code Locked On. You get a $100 match on your first deposit. Terms and conditions apply. See Sleeper's terms of use and details. Currently operational in over 30 states. Check out Sleeper today and check out my co-host for today. As he's here every week from the desert, where he's crossed the desert on a horse with no name. Sign in, please. Yeah, don't know how to ride a horse. Been horseback a couple times. It hurts the pelvis area a lot. Miller Thomas, host of Locked on Dimebacks here. You can catch me on Twitter at CreatorThomas24 for the personal account. Look up Locked on Dimebacks, both Twitter, Instagram for the podcast handle. And please, we're on all your podcasting platforms and hit subscribe on the Locked on Dimebacks YouTube channel. I'm up north for a couple of days. I'm in, I'm in the Bay Area just for a few days, and I was uh, went to the Oakland A's game. Uh, the A's and the Padres uh, played yesterday in front of friends and family. Uh, I had a wonderful. I look at. I always have a wonderful time in Oakland, uh, and you will see part of my journey there in a couple of episodes of the show. I recorded one where I just kind of went around the stadium to give you an idea of you know, the good and the bad. I mean, the, the, there's no there's no sugarcoating the fact that the Oakland Coliseum is falling apart. That being said, I make the case that every baseball fan in 2024 should make an effort to go to a game in Oakland. And I make my case for that. Now, I'm not sure what day that's dropping, but uh, I'm going to be doing that. I recorded a couple other things there too. So you'll if you see a bunch of episodes with me with it, as the backdrop, you know, I shot all of that yesterday, so I had a lot of fun there. And uh, Wes Hoffman, my buddy, was at the game there, too. So, you know, he's the single biggest A's fan I know. He goes to uh, Stockton Ports games and Modesto Nut games wow. and San Jose Giant games to see the prospects. And then he's always there at the A's game. He is a rabid, rabid A's fan. And if they move to Vegas, wouldn't surprise me if he takes the trip out there. So, uh uh, one of the original guests on the old Sully Baseball Podcast. So just shout out there to uh, Wes. And that actually is going to bring us to the trivia question. Mm. And the trivia question was, when the A's under owner Charlie Finley won those three straight World Series, they went to the playoffs five straight years, and they joined the Yankees as the only team to ever win the World Series three straight years, 72, 73, and 74, who was the general manager who put those teams together? And Court Stell, who guesses on a lot of these, got it right. The Brad answer Pitt. was, Brad wasn't Pitt. Brad Pitt. Mm. No, it was not Brad Pitt. It was Charlie Finley himself. He mm. had fired the general managers in 1970, said, I could do this myself. And they went on under his, tu- under his stewardship to win five straight division titles and three straight World Series. And, yes, he had scouts and everything working who helped draft the Reggie Jacksons and the Sal Bandos. But, to be fair, Charlie Finley, as the owner, took a ton of chances on players that nobody else wanted. An example was a pitcher out of high school in North Carolina that all the other teams said, no, we're not going to touch this guy because shortly before – at the beginning of his senior year, he shot himself with a shotgun in the Whoa. foot and completely messed up his delivery. And so all the other teams said, no, thanks. 
And Charlie Finley said, yes, please, I'll sign you. And he became Hall of Famer Catfish Hunter. Whoa. And he was was one of the first ones to really understand the importance of the draft. And he drafted – the Mets had the number one pick. They drafted Steve Chilcott. And the A's had the number two pick. They drafted Reggie Jackson. Reggie Jackson is in the Hall of Fame. Steve Chilcott played as many major league games as me. And so he understood the importance of the draft and made great, great trades. So, hey, Charlie Finley, madman, but – you name a GM who's had the team win three straight World Series titles other than Brian Cashman. Okay, uh, oh. Corstel, good job there. Get the trivia question there, correct? I got a trivia question uh, all lined up for the end, which has nothing to do with the A's, or does it? Um, let's check in on the playoff picture. Uh, once again, it's complete and total confusion. The fact that the Boston Red Sox have, let's face it, decided to call it a season, mm-hmm. um, and they've it looks like they're on the verge of being swept by Toronto. Okay. Uh, oh, wait, no, they've tied the game at this point. Okay, fair enough. But uh, with that and a couple of key losses to Seattle, suddenly Toronto, who just a couple of days ago looked like they were dead in the water, are back in the playoff picture, and they're taking advantage of it with an extra inning win the other day, and if they win today, it'll be yet another walk-off win. Yeah, and they have a pretty strong rotation to do it because Kevin Gosman quietly, you know, one of the better pitchers in the American League going to get some Cy Young votes. You pair that with a Chris Bassett and you pair that with a Jose Barrios who's all been heating up. And Vlad Guerrero Jr., we can't mention. I've had some discussions on podcasts of is Vlad Guerrero Jr. maybe a little overrated compared to that amazing season he had, you know, a couple years ago. Hasn't really lived up to the expectations. But over the last couple of weeks, specifically this weekend, he's really heated up for the Blue Jays. And he can carry an offense. And so that Blue Jays team is loaded with talent. So it's not a surprise to see them back in the playoff picture. Uh, today, the Guardians smacked around the Rangers. Uh, there's half a game separ- basically separates three teams at the top of the a- uh, an AL West, or basically game and a half. So if you mm-hmm. lose a game and you're the Mariners, the Astros, or the Rangers, it's going to haunt you big time. We'll see if this 9-2 to loss is going to haunt uh, the Rangers, as right now the Astros are beating the Royals. But remember, the Royals came back and beat the Astros the other day, and the the Mariners are, are playing Los Angeles, so – it's uh you know it's it's pretty tight it's pretty tight going on there yeah that's a fiery division too with the fan bases with the stuff here you know we just got a lot going on with that division and i'm just rooting for all the teams all the fans all the podcast hosts because whoever doesn't make it someone is going to be pretty mad and pretty steaming because the astros mariners and rangers i mean at all different points of the season have had that division title um in the grass have been a division leader at some point i mean the rangers have been so good throughout the whole season we know about the history with the astros and then the mariners have just really really heated up over the last couple months. So whoever of those three teams don't make it to the postseason, I'm just going to have, uh, you know, I'm just going to be feeling really empathetic for the lockdown podcast host. Now let's also point out, you cannot circle the schedule and say, well, here's some easy wins coming up because I guarantee you the San Francisco Giants circled the schedule when the Rockies were coming up and the Reds circled the schedule when the Mets were coming up. And first of all, the Giants have had it, even if they, they're currently winning right now in the fifth, even if they win, this has been a disastrous trip to Coors Field because a four game set with the terrible Rockies and the Giants lost the first three games, including the game on Friday where Anderson basically, he threw seven no hit innings. The Rockies took a no hitter into the ninth. You should never be no hit in cores, especially not by this pitching staff in Colorado. They're not exactly throwing Glavin Maddox and Smoltz at you. And then the Giants who needed a bases loaded walk to push a second run across in cores wound up blowing the game in the bottom of the ninth with a weird wild throw home, which allowed the tying and winning runs to score. You ca- And then the, yesterday they had a double header against the Rockies and they got swept in the double header. So even if they win this game today, they went into cores knowing they desperately needed to keep winning to keep pace with everybody else. And they dropped the first three games. They're trying to avoid a four game sweep at the hands of one of the worst teams in baseball at a point where every game 
means more and more and more because there's we're only got two weeks left. Yeah, and the great Ben Caspic of Locked On Giants actually posted some very interesting stats about this Giants team over the last few weeks in terms of their home road splits because apparently this Giants franchise are on a nine-game road losing streak right now. So maybe it's not a total surprise that they went to Coors Field because since July 19th, they're 4-23 and on the road according to the great Ben Caspic of Lockdown Giants. So this is a team where when they've been at home, they've been able to win games. They've been able to keep pace because even if you look at their last 10 games, they're still a 500 team. You look at their record over the last couple months, the Giants team is still keeping pace in that wild card mix so it's actually insane to think that this team is struggling so much on the road and is still within three games of making it to the postseason with but, two three, weeks left. But, but three games with two weeks left is a that is a huge order because you have to have multiple teams in front of you fold on the fact that the reds are losing to the mets uh that that helps matters for them but the fact of the matter is you can't, if you're trying to keep pace with all them and you're going to play one of the worst teams in baseball, this is just, if if the Giants miss the playoffs, mm-hmm. this is going to be what they're going to look back on. This is the, this is the moment that they're going to say, wow, this is, I, I can't believe this. I can't believe it's not butter. And I can't believe that this is the way okay. this team has fallen apart. Uh, let's give uh, a big shout out to uh let, let's let's be positive some of the people who have shown up uh sunny gray uh pitching today for the minnesota twins twins are uh are going to win this game against the white Sox, and they are marching closer and closer to a division title um and speaking of a team that you always dismiss because they're a regular season team right now the rays have a lead over the orioles if they hold on to that lead, they're going to be in a virtual tie for first place. Uh, yeah. And that's 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 big big time for the Rays. Yeah, the Rays are the only team in the American League with at least seven wins in their last 10 games. So they've been able to close the gap in the American League East. Really, if you look at the whole Major League Baseball standings right now, like every team is either like – between four and six wins in their last 10 games. Like everyone is basically playing 500 baseball over the last couple of weeks. And the Rays are the only team that's playing at a better pace than that. So this team, as you just said, they're a regular season team. In my opinion, I love what they're doing. They're going to have a great roster entering the postseason. We're going to be feeling good about the Rays. They're going to have one of the best records in the American league. Then they're going to lose in the divisional round, maybe the championship series in six games or less. And it's going to be another season. It's going to be another season. We're like, man, that Rays team was really fun. But uh, analytics once again take them out. Well, hey, let's let's point out the other team in Florida, the Miami Marlins. You circle the calendar that they have a series against the Braves. Now, granted, the Braves have clinched and they could they could uh, uh, ease up on the throttle, but they're still playing the freaking Braves. And Jake Berger, Luis Arise, uh, uh Jorge Soler, their bats, uh, J- uh, Jazz yeah. Jr. From yeah. the from the commercial where he can act and Derek Jeter can't, um, they're just they are hitting the tar out of the ball and they are taking advantage of the Reds' losses of the Giants' losses. There's still a half game out, but there's still you know you look at the counter. Oh God, we got to play the Braves. They showed up. Their bats are going crazy, and they've lost. They get the horrible news that they've lost Sandy Alcantara for the rest of the season, and mm-hmm. that's devastating because Alcantara was pitching very well in the second half of the season. But still, and well, by the way, in terms of he won the NL Cy Young Award last year, we're going to talk a little bit later about this year's NL Cy Young, which if you could figure it out, you know, God bless you. But give the Marlins credit; they have shown up to play, and they're not. They are. If they don't get in, they are literally going down swinging. And I think that that's fantastic because those those players I just listed, Soler, Jazz, Arise, Berger, they are all such exciting players to watch. And I have to make this pitch permanently go to the red tops. I love the red tops mm. for the Marlins uniforms. I like the teal, hate the black ones where you can't read the writing because it's black on black. It looks weird. But the red tops, oh, mm. Chef's kiss.
Yeah, there's not many teams in a crucial wild card race that could lose the reigning Cy Young Award winner and still feel good about the rotation because the Marlins are just absolutely loaded with young starters with the Lozardos, <laughs> the Braxton Garretts, the Yuri Perez's. And then, like you mentioned, their offensive players are heating up. We said entering the season, this Marlins team was going to be in the mix. You, I think, picked them to make the I post-season. picked them to be a wild card team, yeah. Yeah, I was like, I think they're going to be good. I don't think they're going to be a wild card team. But I was like, they're going to be a, a competitive team this year because of that rotation. Rotation. My biggest mm-hmm. question was, can they score enough runs to match this rotation? And you look at them the last month. I mean, the Solaires have had a breakout season with the Ariises and all those guys you just mentioned. Jazz Chisholm, when he's healthy, he's a true difference maker. There's a reason he's on the cover of MLB The Show. Maybe it was a little bit too early for Jazz Chisholm, but this guy's got true 30-30 potential. So when you have all those guys cooking, their deadline was a crush, like you said, with the Jake Burgers and the Josh Bells of the world. Just added two more offensive pieces in that lineup. There's really not a hole on this roster too much. And like I said on a podcast a couple of weeks ago, the Marlins are the team in this wild card race that scares me the most when I look at that lineup, when I look at that rotation, and look at the, all the young talent that they have on that team right now. And they're staying healthy. And mm-hmm. speak of speaking of staying healthy. If you need some life-saving antibiotics, the best place to get some is Jace medical because everyone should be empowered to care for themselves and their loved ones during the unexpected. That's why Jace Medical offers the Jace case. The Jace case provides five life-saving antibiotics for emergency use and gives you a peace of mind so that you're not just hoping that you have access to medication in an emergency. Jace Medical makes sure you have the medication in hand. Jace Medical is simple. They handle everything from online evaluation to licensed pharmacy medication delivery and ongoing consultation and care. Don't get caught unprepared. Save more than $360 by getting these life-saving antibiotics with Jace Medical plus an additional $20 off by using code Locked on at checkout, jacemedical.com. That's J A S E medical.com. Promo code locked on. By the way, do you know who should be contacting Jace Medical? Is Shohei Otani. Okay. Uh, Shohei Otani. Painkillers? Um, yeah. Um, I don't know how familiar you are. I'm going to date myself with the movie Caddyshack, but there's a movie the, in the scene when. Rodney was desperately trying to get out of a golf tournament and he hit a golf ball and it ricocheted off his arm. It very clearly just glanced him. But then he kind of looked around and said, Oh, my arm. I think it's broken. I think it's broken. Um, I think Shohei Otani may have done that a couple of the last couple of days. Uh, some people have been quick to correct me when I was saying he didn't show up to the photo op, that he had something to do. Of course he had something to do. Um, <laughs> yeah. And uh, and now he's like, yeah, I'm kind of hurt. Uh, bye. He's cleared out the locker. You know, we've already seen that he can't pitch because of Terry. He has an oblique. He says, I'm out of here. And, and of course, he cleared out his locker before the Angels could make any sort of announcement. So, you know, uh, Stacey Gotsoulias of Lockdown Yankees pointed out, can the Angels do anything right? Like, they have to make even the act of Shohei Otani clearing out his locker some sort <laughs> of mystery that we have to solve. It's like they can't get ahead of anything um, there is no scenario where Shohei Otani signs with the Angels at this point. He's, I think he's more likely to sign with the Montreal Expos, that they would form an Expos team just so Otani could sign with them. That, he will sign with the Savannah Bananas before he signs with the Angels at this point. He, it's, it's over. Why would he come back? I mean the I'm not gonna lie, the vibes aren't good. I've been on the no, band you think? <laughs> I, I've been on the let, let's give a little bit of hope. You know, it's not over just yet. Maybe the injury actually helps Otani come back to the Angels. But what we've seen the last couple of weeks with the reporting and just his nonchalant attitude toward the organization. I mean, and I don't even blame the guy because I think no. if Otani didn't tear his uh, you know, UCL or whatever, I think he would still be playing right now. I yes. truly think if he was fully healthy, I don't think this is like Otani just quitting on his situation. It's I'm hurt. I'm probably going to have to get Tommy John. Why am I just going to do the Bryce Harper DH thing if we're literally not playing for anything at this point in the season? Might as well just wrap it up instead of, you know, trying to get further injuries. So I totally get it from that perspective of Otani. And, yeah, right now 
it, it probably feels like Otani is leaving the LA Angels. And listen, until that actually happens, I'm still going to hold on to the idea that it was smart for the Angels to go all in at the deadline and try to keep their superstar. But once we see Otani officially signed with the Arizona Diamondbacks this offseason, I'm going to have to change my tune and say, yeah, they should have moved him at the deadline. I was very adamant about yeah. my stance. He, they, they had to, they couldn't do this. This was the scenario they had to avoid. And again, it's nice that they acquired a bunch of people. And I'm, I'm sure uh, I can get a Lucas Giolito Angels jersey for you real cheap. Real yeah. cheaply. Because the uh, thing with, if you traded Otani at the deadline, you you would have got maybe something, but would that return been great? Probably not. We saw when the Orioles traded Machado at the deadline a few years ago. Yeah, he got back something, but in the end, it amounted to nothing. So I didn't mind the Angels saying, you know what? Why not try to do everything to keep Otani, even though it was probably a little too little too late at that. Why not? Why not? Because it, they're it, getting it, nothing. They're they getting nothing. nothing for way, him. Probably. You no, you, you could get something? you had the chance to get something. And this is I am I'm gonna say something philosophical here. Something is better than nothing. But I look what at what they like, got was the worst case scenario. Nothing. But I look at like Machado and Arenado and yeah, Beth there have been bad like, trades. There have been bad trades. I'm yes. like most of the time you get nothing if you're just most of the time. Them. Every once in a while you you're get a that. Sandy Alcantara. Every once in a while you get a Zach Gallen. Every yeah. once in a while you get someone. You get a Randy Arozarena. You know, maybe, maybe you know you roll up your sleeves and you say, hey. There's a couple players you have here who I think, you know, or you're not giving your number one prospect. All right, give up your four and five prospect or something like that. At least that's something. Why? I mean, sometimes you can get something. And the the idea, the possibility that that person is going to become a Josh Donaldson, who was a toss in the Rich Harden trade and wound up becoming an MVP. Obviously, the greatest case scenario would be a Ryan Sandberg or a Jeff Bagwell or a John Smoltz, where you got a Hall of Famer you know, in a, a prospect swap. But, you know, it, or if you get a good major leaguer, that beats this. The real and, issue is the Angels never trading Otani like last season or extending Otani last season or building a competitive roster going into this season, trying to do it on the fly at the deadline, just sitting on your hands at the deadline with Otani. Like at this point, I think all of it was moot once you got to the deadline at this point. I think all the real issues probably started, you know, last year in the offseason, the year prior, the last 10 years, the whole Mike Trout era. I think you could point to the issues back then. It all, you know what? You can trace it back to that, what, 10, 11 game losing streak they had last year because they actually were a playoff team going into June. Yeah, when they and then right they, before they went, the Madden thing. They went in the massive tailspin that cost Madden his job. And from that moment, from that moment up until the trade deadline, it's been chaos. And so here we go. I mean, it's all but official. It is all but official. And now his season is over. His season is done. And, um, you know, I think he's going to, you know, is he going to be with the Red Sox? Is he going to be with the Cubs? Is he going to be with mm. the Dodgers? Is he going to be with the Mariners? going to be with the Giants? going to be with the Mets? Some team's going to pony up for him. And some team that's a lot closer to the playoffs than the Angels. So, you know, there you go. Yeah, when I'm just looking at the Angels, like, record last year. Like, at the end of... You know, in, in like the middle of May, this was a team that was like seven, eight games above 500. They're like 24 and 16 at one point last season. So it's like they did get off to a little bit of a hot start and then yeah, all went down in the all gutter. And <laughs> and using your money to spend on guys like Anthony Rendon have just been an absolute disaster for your franchise. And meanwhile, you get money spent on players and their performance, but no longer Otani. Some of them will be sleeper picks. Did somebody say sleeper? The okay. Major League Baseball playoffs are right around the corner, which means the clock is ticking on your chance for 100 times your cash on daily fantasy baseball. And this is the great time of the year. I mean, we mentioned players like Arise and Soler and uh, Jazz and uh, Vlad Guerrero Jr. is heating up. Mookie Betts is getting some big hits. Uh, Berger the other day. I mean, all these mm -hmm. players are putting up some big, big numbers. Uh, what's his name? Uh, 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 the kid from the Baltimore Orioles, uh, Gunnar Henderson. Is it Gunnar Henderson? 
They all yeah. sound the same. All their prospects <laughs> sound the same. They all sound like they should have been, you know, uh, characters on Beverly Hills 90210. But I digress. If you want to get 100 times your money, you got to pick more or less on stats for stars like those on for home runs, hits, strikeouts, and more for a 100 times payout on Sleeper. Get your picks right. You can win big. <clears throat> Entries can be made in just under a minute. And you have group team chat functionality in the app. Use promo code Locked On. You get a $100 match on your first deposit. Terms and conditions apply. See Sleeper's terms of use for details. Sleeper, let's win some money. The NL Cy Young race. Oh. Last year, it was cut and dry. Yeah. Sandy Alcantara. Absolutely. This year, um, this year is weird. This year is very weird because... Up until a few weeks ago, Zach Gallen was the guy. Mm -hmm. Then he had a couple of crummy starts. He had a rotten start against Los Angeles, the Dodgers, where he got bombed. Then he had a terrible start against Baltimore. Okay, but those are two of the best teams. And then he on just on the 8th of September against Chicago, not a bad team, a playoff team, and a team they were chasing, he threw a complete game three hit shutout. Struck out nine Cubs, one nothing, no less. And when that happened, I said, he's back. He's back. He's going to win the Cy Young Award. And then he promptly got smoked by the Mets in his next start. And so what looked like a slam dunk for Zach Gallen has turned into an absolute free-for-all of which um, Spencer Strider is in the middle of it. Uh, uh, Logan Webb of San Francisco is in the middle of it. And Blake and and uh, uh, and Snell from mm -hmm. uh, San Diego has a chance to join. Say it with me: Gaylord Perry, Roger Clemens, Randy Johnson, and Pedro Martinez as someone to win the Cy Young Award in both the American League and National League. Insane! Is he going to be a Hall of Famer, Blake? Snell? Like those? I, I mean, saying that in a normal world, Clemens would be in the Hall of Fame. Perry's in the Hall of Fame. Randy Johnson, the Hall of Fame. Pedro Martinez in the Hall of Fame, and Blake Snell, all timer legend. I when you when you think of the greats, you know when I'm when my grandkid is on my knee and yeah. say, Grandpa Sully, tell me about when you saw Blake Snell. And <laughs> yeah. I'll tell you where he was absolutely mowing down the Los Angeles Dodgers in game six of the World Series, let up one hit, and Kevin Cash absolutely panicked and took him out. And the nanosecond he took him out, I sent out a tweet that said, congratulations, Los Angeles Dodgers, on winning the 2020 World Series, which they did. Still, I think one of the single worst managerial decisions ever made because we all knew it was dumb in real time. That being said, I don't know what to make. I'm still leaning towards Zach Gallen just because of the the, the – the his overall season but it's it's becoming less and less it's that's kind of like the way you're holding on to otani to stay with <laughs> the angels that's me holding on ironically to a diamond back to winning the cy young award what's your take on all this yeah i love zach allen i think one of these years he will win the cy young but i don't think it will be this year i don't even think he's going to be on the mlb network show where they show wow. the three finalists i don't even wow. think he's going to be one of the three finalists Funny thing right now, if you actually look at the FanDuel odds, it's a two-team race, two-team, two-player race. Blake Snell, overwhelming favorite at minus 900. I mean, when you look at the stats for Blake Snell, he's number one in war for pitchers, number one in ERA. He's top five in wins. He's number one in hits per nine. He's number two in strikeouts. He's basically top two in every major statistic. So Blake Snell, I think, is going to win the award hands down at this point in the season. Number two in FanDuel odds is Justin Steele at plus 700. And then yeah. Sully, kind of a late surprise, late addition at plus 7,000, tied for number three. Rookie for the New York Mets, Kodai Senga is now tied for top three in the Cy Young Award race. How do you feel about Senga now coming into uh, the top three? I think it's been a good acquisition. Um, I do think there should be a different category. I think we should call it the Ichiro Suzuki Award because uh, I think a a player coming from a professional league who you know is is different is a is maybe their first year from a professional league, but that's different from your coming up from the minor leagues. <laughs> you know, I think that you know the fact that Ichiro Suzuki won the Rookie of the Year. Um, or Shohei Otani won the Rookie of the Year 
when they were an established professional player in a professional league. I think that that to me isn't a rookie. You know, yes, they're in a different league, but and I understand it's their first year in the majors. Um, and you could make the case for the players like you know Jackie Robinson who played for the Kansas City Monarchs before. You could make that case as well. But I, I, Senga has been a very good acquisition for the Mets. I think he's been good. He's been one of the few bright spots this year. And as the Mets and Stearns are now going to look forward to building a roster from within and taking your time instead of doing the quick fix, which they tried, I think they're going to have Senga as a, as a solid uh, building block of that team. Uh, I don't think he's going to win it. Um, right now, Snell looks like he's going to win. It's unbelievable. Yeah, it's Snell's award. Yeah. It, yeah, it's unbelievable how fast he overtook everybody. Uh, I, I'm still, I you know, and I, as I said, uh, Snell was obviously gaining on everyone. And when Gallon threw that shutout, I thought, like, oh, he's back. He's going to claim it. And it just hasn't worked out. Yeah, and... Gallon just has had too many bad starts in the last month in the most pivotal point of the season when your team is in this wild card race. I think that is going to ding him when it's like, okay, each game is so important. Each game is going to – like you're tied in these third spot for the wild card. Like every game matters. And then Gallon keeps going out there and giving up six earned runs, it seems like, every start. I just think that's going to ding him in this race. How weird a year is this for San Diego? Well, they have all these superstars. If you win, they're going to have all the superstars on the team and multiple manager of the year winner Bob Melvin at the helm coming off a year where they got to the NLCS and they wake up and Snell is going to win the Cy Young Award and there's a log jam for the NL playoffs and they're not involved in it. I mean, how weird a year is uh super weird i think the numbers too would tell you like they have one of the better run differentials in the national league yeah. they have like one of the best pitching staffs in terms of era and in the entire you know entire major league baseball so it's like the numbers tell you like maybe this padres team statistically should be in the mix and that's why i think they're my bounce back team to make it to the postseason next year just because i think they're entirely too loaded when you look at the stars in their lineup when you look at the stars in their rotation i just think they have too many guys who have another just disappointing season like this next year but the guy who is going to win the cy young award blake snell he is going to be a free agent this offseason also i think josh Hader is going to be in a, a free agent this offseason for the padres so they're going to have big decisions to make because you're going to have blake snell coming off a cy young award season like He's going to be very expensive. He chose the right time to win a Cy Young Award. And then Josh Hader has like a sub 1.3 year race. So the Padres are going to have some big decisions to make on those two pitching stars of whether to bring them back on major price tags or not. Because we know they already have so much money committed to the payroll right now. All right. Well, and you still have Juan Soto not even locked up yet, too. And it's going to be an interesting offseason. It's also going to see if Bob Melvin will actually survive this. Oh, you know. Because he's got only one year left in his contract, I mean, there's been talk of you know leadership issues with the team um, that usually falls on the head of the manager. So we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens. I'm still a Bob Melvin fan, but uh, all right, we'll look at. Look, we're going to see. Got another uh, another couple of weeks of this, and then we'll see the postseason. But let's postseason's coming about. Postseason heroes. We don't know who the next big postseason hero is going to be. But this brings about the trivia question. Who is the only first overall pick in the MLB draft to go on to become the World Series MVP? There have been Hall of Famers. There have been MVPs. But only one has gone on to be the World Series MVP. Who is the only number one overall pick to win the World Series MVP? So send your answers. Post it here on YouTube or on uh, Twitter or whatever it's called now at Locked On MLB Pods or mine, Ooh. which is Sully Baseball. Have you figured it out? I think I know who it is now. All right, well, tell me when we're done. I don't want to spoil okay, it for everyone. Yeah. So, uh, Miller, where can people follow you? Follow me on Twitter at Career Times 24 for the personal account. Look up Locked On Diamondbacks, both Twitter and Instagram. We're on all your streaming platforms, of course. And please just subscribe to Locked On Diamondbacks on YouTube. All right. Well, let's wrap up another weekend here and another week of baseball. This has been a Locked On MLB, Locked On Diamondbacks crossover. He's Miller Thomas. I'm your pal, Sully. Let's fist bump for another week. <laughs>